uh, activity involving the lava lamp, and uh, Swa and Anna were kind enough to go procure a lava lamp for me, but unfortunately I've just discovered today that even though I plugged it in at 8.30, it still hasn't really warmed up. So um, I've got some movies that I just found here. It, it's sort of working, but um, there's something that's going on in these ones that have fully warmed up that's a bit different, and I'm gonna play it now. Uh, and if you'll notice, the, um, the blobs rise quite quickly and they congregate at the top up there. The way these lamps work, and I'm now gonna do what they tell you not to do in the instructions, uh, there's, a, there's a light in here. <laughs> so it's heating the bottom. There's, there's some wax, some colored wax, uh, with some additive in it so that it's approximately neutrally buoyant once the thing warms up. And the wax is heating and, uh-oh, now the video is doing something else and looking at that person there. All right. Um, anyway, the question is, why, why are these blobs rising so fast, and then so, why are so many of them congregating at the top, and then sinking so slowly? So what I want you guys to do is divide into groups of two or three, and we're going to take two minutes, and I want you to see if you can come to an agreement on why that's happening. Okay, so go. We've got two minutes. What that is again? Why is it that these things are rising quickly, congregating the top and then taking longer to come back down again. There's an asymmetry in the way the convection's happening in this lava lamp, which you can't really see in this one because they're not even getting up to the top yet. Um, so that's what I want you to try to ask yourself, why is that happening? So talk to your neighbor for a couple minutes and see if you can come to a conclusion. <laughs> Okay, I think it's been a couple minutes, and I hear the, the volume level decreasing slightly. So, um, so who, who wants to, uh, who thinks they know <clears throat> at least one, and there may be more than one thing going on here, uh, who wants to volunteer a possible explanation? Come on, somebody has to, you guys, yes. Is it because the rate of cooling of the passes at the top? Is slower than the rate of heating of the parcel at the bottom. Who thinks that probably has something to do with it? Yeah, okay, I think so. You've got a heat source at the bottom, and the whole thing is cooling, right? Probably the whole bottle is cooling, and at equilibrium, those things are going to have to balance. Um, so that's an asymmetry. Uh, but uh, is there anything else that anybody thought of that might be important here? One have to um, overcome the surface tension of the other cooler to the bottom. Yeah. So it finally overcomes that tension, it will shoot up into the top and then slowly pull out. 
Yeah, you can see obvious surface tension effect at the bottom, but it's not so obvious at the top. So there's a, a potential barrier for it to overcome. And once it gets there, it can accelerate. Another thing I noticed is that the smaller blobs seem to move faster. That's definitely something that won't be true for atmospheric convection, I don't think. But, uh, and I'm not sure why that is. Maybe because they uh, don't lose as much heat before they break free or something. Anyway, okay, so that was just to get the, the people, the, the juices flowing after the morning's talk. Um, I'll just stop this and try to start my presentation. Okay. So, um, so the subject today is going to be moist convection. Uh, moist convection just means it involves water vapor. And water vapor does stuff, it condenses and it comes out and sometimes this can happen. Um, this happens under very rare circumstances where the temperature is just right and the liquid water freezes when it lands. I think this is in uh, Queensland, um, <laughs> this, this, this photo actually. Now, um, <laughs> it could be. Uh, so th th whether this stuff happens depends on things like how, how rapidly air moves up in thunderstorms. So one of the um, themes of the talk is going to be uh, addressing that issue, is what, what controls the morphology of the convection when it includes water vapor, and why is it that we sometimes get um, strong drafts upward and weaker drafts sinking? Does anybody know where the pens are for this thing? Just one hit. Ah, okay, I couldn't see that. All right, thanks. So I'll be getting to that in a minute. So. Um, there's, I'm just going to start off with two ingredients uh, that we need to know before we um, go ahead. And one is, and I think everybody knows it, ooh, it's a bit hard to see. The brightness is a bit high. Um, when air moves up in the atmosphere, it, uh, it expands because of the do dropping pressure. And when it expands, its temperature drops. And so we get a decrease with height of temperature in the atmosphere. So I'm going to draw, just for future reference, a typical temperature profile. Okay, and uh, we have something, let's see, something that looks a bit like that. All right, and it's decreasing with height basically because of this. So hopefully you all have seen this sort of thing before. And then the other thing that we need to know about water vapor is that the equilibrium uh, water vapor content of air is very temperature dependent. In fact, it increases quasi exponentially with temperature. So um, this here is, a, is an equilibrium curve. This is if you had both phases sitting together until they came to equilibrium. If you're ever up here, you're always going to have, in practice, very rapid condensation back down to this curve uh, because there's always some surface around an aerosol particle or something to condense onto. Whereas if you're on this side, you'll only um, moisten up to the curve if there's uh, condensed water around to evaporate into the air. So you often find air that's below saturation, and so the relative humidity is how we measure the ratio of the true uh, water vapor amount to the equilibrium amount. This is a vapor pressure curve, but we can convert that if we know the true pressure uh, to a mixing ratio. And we call this equilibrium the saturation mixing ratio, and the ratio of R to R S is the relative humidity. So this is just a review of, of humidity concepts. But the main thing here is that this is very strongly varying with temperature uh, to such an extent that uh, water vapor amounts that are found near the surface are way above, whoops, way above what can be sustained higher up. So I'm now going to make a graph of R, and it tends to look like this. Uh, let's see, so, um, and we might imagine sometimes having a relatively uh, moist environment and other times having a relatively dry environment like that, okay? Doesn't vary so much near the surface, but it varies a lot higher up. And I'll get into why that is later. Okay, so um, because of uh, this thermodynamics, we end up with temperature decreasing with height. We, the lapse rate is the name that we use for the rate at which that happens. If there's no water vapor in the air, 
Then uh, on Earth, where we have 80% nitrogen and 20% oxygen, uh, we get a lapse rate that's uh, 9.8 degrees per kilometer. It's just the ratio of G to the specific heat of gas. Okay, so it's a, it's a constant. However, because of what I just showed you, uh, as soon as you start dropping the temperature of any air, eventually you're going to reach its saturation point, and thereafter, uh, any further decreases in temperature are going to be buffered by the release of latent heat. And so the temperature uh, last rate is going to slow down to something that is less than 4.9 degrees per kilometer and might drop as low as 4 if you're in a very, very high moisture condition. And um, this gives us uh, a change of temperature which is less than that one. And to get it quantitatively, and this is, I think, the only equation I'm going to show you today because I know I'm the last speaker and you've, you've had it up to here with equations. So no more. Okay, but to get, um, to get this lapse rate, we have to take account of the fact that the heat, and I'm going to use the letter Q not for quasi-geostrophy or any of the other things that have popped up with uh, this week, but for heat uh, um, generation is the latent heat of vaporization times the change in water vapor mixing ratio. These are all specific quantities, so they're per unit mass of air. This, as we've seen, is a function of temperature and pressure. Uh, and therefore, um, we can, by combining those with the ideal gas law and the first law of thermodynamics, derive um, an alternative change in temperature. Now, you'll often see formulas for this, which look kind of ugly, but I don't like to use them uh, for a reason that I will explain in a couple of slides. Instead, what we can do is we can define uh, an adiabatic, a pseudo-adiabatic invariant called the equivalent potential temperature, theta E. And you can work through uh, the mathematics that I just, um, starting from the equations I just mentioned, you have to make some kind of um, course approximations and you can then show that theta E is approximately equal to theta times E to the L sub V R over C sub P times some temperature T, which is vaguely defined because it, it was had to be assumed constant in the calculation. This is only accurate to a few degrees, and if you're doing quantitative work, you don't want to use this, but it gives you an idea that um, as your mixing ratio increases, the, the value of this thing becomes greater than theta. And in fact, near the, uh, near the surface of the Earth in the tropics, this uh, is typically like 350 or 360 degrees Kelvin. Because you're getting the, the extra, the humidity in the air is worth uh, that much extra um, uh, moist enthalpy. Okay, so I'm not going to, so you can go and find more accurate uh, formulas for this, which are basically curve fits to numerical calculations, but this is a, a, a rough, gives you a rough idea. Okay, and if I put a little S here, it's just the saturated value. It means that we're assuming the air is saturated in calculating it. Okay, uh, so we've looked um, this morning already uh, and in uh, some of the other lectures at stability. And um, based on what we heard from the last lecture, uh, you would know that um, if the buoyancy of, or the, or, and from your experiments, if the density of the air is decreasing with height, then the air is stable. If it's increasing with height, then it's unstable. <clears throat> but we would have to look at the potential temperature of the air to judge its, uh, its to, to judge this because it's dense, it's, uh, Temperature changes when it changes pressure. So we don't want to compare two temperatures. We always have to think uh, in terms of theta. But if we, had, if we had a layer where theta was uniform with height, it would be neutrally stable. Um, and uh, so what we're showing here is that if the environmental lapse rate is shallower even than the moist adiabatic lapse rate, uh, then it definitely has to be stable, okay? Because even if the air is saturated, uh, if we take a parcel of air and we imagine an infinitesimal displacement upward, uh, it's going to be cooler 
than the air on the other side because it's going to follow this uh, moist adiabatic trajectory here, whereas the environment is doing that. It's going to be cooler. You're going to have a restoring force on it, even if it's saturated. Okay. If, uh, on the other hand, you can imagine this situation where the environmental lapse rate is steeper even than a dry adiabatic. So that tells you that even if the air is, uh, doesn't have any water vapor in it, it will cool at this um, 9.8 degree per, per kilometer rate, but if the environment is cooling at more than that, like 11 degrees per kilometer, it's unstable. Okay, so this is the situation where we would expect to get convection like we were seeing with the, the ridiculously high Rayleigh numbers um, before tea break. Okay. However, uh, what we very often see in reality is uh, profiles that are in between these two extremes. Okay, they're not steep enough that they're absolutely unstable to any perturbation, even without any condensation. Um, but they're also not stable enough that we know there would always be a restoring force. It ends up depending. It depends on whether there's water vapor in the air or not. And um, this creates a, uh, an ambiguous situation. And in fact, in general, we cannot get away with linear stability analysis in looking at moist convection because of this ambiguity. We have to worry about two variables at once, the temperature and the humidity. Okay, now when you do have um, instability, um, this is just to show you what kind of phenomenon you get. You get a, uh, a deep convective cloud. Um, one thing you can see in here is that there's a lot of uh, smaller elements within the larger elements sort of popping out, um, which are called thermals. And one of the research projects in my group is to study the dynamics of these thermals, but I'm not going to talk about them today. Uh, but what you see here is this very explosive growth of a cloud. And if, uh, on the other hand, if you have a very stable situation, you get this boring sort of stratiform clouds, which um, may still have some interesting phenomena going on in there. You can see some, potentially some waves uh, there, but not, um, not this vertical growing in intense instability. So the way we try to diagnose this, given when we're in this ambiguous gray zone, is we use what we call parcel theory. And um, we imagine taking parcels of air from somewhere near the surface where they have a high value of this theta E, which is conserved. And we, um, we imagine them rising. Usually they start off at a relative humidity of less than 100%. So they will initially follow a, a dry idea of that of 9.8 degrees per kilometer. And um, at some point they'll hit something which we call the lifting condensation level, which is where we expect the base of the cloud to form. And thereafter, uh, we expect them to follow this moist idea of that, which is more gentle. So you can see here an example of a profile where if it had continued uh, with a dry ascent, it would always have been um, colder than the environmental sounding. So you wouldn't expect dry convection in this case. However, uh, once you hit this level, uh, lifting condensation level, and start following the moist adiabat, because of the latent heat release, you wind up warmer than the environmental air. So eventually, you could imagine this air reaching a point where it is positively buoyant. And um, I'm showing you this, this uh, figure rather, I'm not going to try to um, teach you about tephagrams or anything because that would just be too much. But uh, so this is sort of I slightly idealized, but it, it pictures um, what we call uh, the convective available potential energy, which is the integral of this positive buoyancy through here. So you can get a, um, an amount of energy that's available for doing work by, by integrating this quantity. Okay, so um, this is something that you, you encounter a lot in this in, in looking at moist convection, a measure of the potential energy. But to get to this point, you don't have a positive buoyancy until you get up here. So you've got to get all the way from there to here without any positive reinforcement from buoyancy. And in fact, in this particular example, there's a little area here of negative buoyancy that you have to blast through. So what we're dealing here with is uh, a subcritical or a finite amplitude instability you have to kick the system hard enough to access this reservoir of energy. It doesn't just happen automatically. So, um, so we can't follow the type of stability analysis that everyone has been doing this week 
where you start with a basic state, you linearize the equations, you consider an infinitesimal perturbation of some form, and look for whether it, ha uh, whether it grows, whether it finds a way to access the energy in the system, you have to consider large perturbations. And, um, and this is sort of the, the canonical way of doing it. And this little barrier here is perhaps analogous to the surface tension in the lava lamp. It's something that holds the convection back, uh, but if you have a, uh, a perturbation that's strong enough to break through this, then you can get this energy. Um, in principle, if all of this were converted to kinetic energy, you would get an updraft that obeyed this uh, relation here. In practice, we usually see updrafts that are far weaker than that. And uh, the main reason for that is, is mixing on the way up, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. Okay, so we've decided that um, there's instability potentially there a lot of the time. Uh, you, you'll, you'll see, in the tropics, you'll see Cape most of the time, if you look. You'll usually see it there. In the summertime over, over Australia, you'll see it. So why do we not always have convection? Well, there's this barrier to get over. There's one reason. How do you get over this barrier? Um, I'm just going to show you one example uh, that shows that this barrier is, is potentially important. And that's to point out that um, it starts off by, by pointing out that this uh, convective instability that I just described can potentially work upside down. Okay, so um, if we have uh, an updraft that gets going because there's some cape, let's say, uh, what's going to happen is that the air rises up, a lot of water is condensed, uh, the con condensation stops it from cooling off so much so it stays warm enough to keep going. It arrives up here uh, warm, and um, with a lot of condensed water in it. And uh, the other graph I was going to draw here, which I'm just going to do now, theta. Um, kind of looks like that. Okay? It's very steeply stratified in the stratosphere. That's why potential vorticity is so high there. And uh, Sort of like that here. So we go from a value of like 300 to a value up here of like 360. Did I say something wrong? No, I was just pleased that you listened to my lecture, that's all. Oh, good, yeah, okay. I, I do occasionally listen to you. Um, all right, so it arrives up here very warm, and um, it's got all this uh, condensed water. So if this if it mixes with some dry air out here, some of that condensed water will evaporate. And that'll reduce the temperature of the air again. So then it won't want to sink. But as long as that water stays there, then the more it sinks, the more water will evaporate. And all of those things that happen to make it go up will happen again when it comes back down. And so sometimes we get these quite strong downdrafts that spread out when they hit the bottom uh, or hit the surface. Okay. And it turns out that they play an interesting role in triggering more convection. I'm going to show you this with a simulation. Okay, this is, uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to show this again later. Uh, and on that slide, I actually have the, the credits for this. It's Murat Karutinov's um, very high resolution simulation. What we're looking at here is the clouds in a, in a grid box about the size of, of a GCM grid cell simulated. You can see there's a bit of wind shear there. And the first thing that we saw, let me start this over again. No, no, no. Okay. The first thing that we see is clouds forming. What's nice about this is it allows you to start, to start from nothing. You can't do that in data. So we have these tiny little clouds forming. They start to coalesce a little bit. Then we start to see rain. Finally, rain gets going in these clouds. It take, there's a bit of a delay there. And then after the rain, you start getting some of those downdrafts. And what we're seeing here in this kind of disgusting image is um, the spreading out of low humidity, which is the light color, air. Cooler, lower humidity air spreading out. Uh, every time there's a big rain um, event, more of this stuff spreads out. And if you look on the edges of these things, you can see it's triggering new clouds all over the place. Okay, all the edges of these outflows are triggering new clouds. And that's because it's a density current, like the ones we just saw this morning, moving along, lifting up the air. Sometimes that's just enough to get it going so that it can access some of that available energy that's there. Okay, so this is just 
one example. There are other things that can happen in the boundary layer, other disturbances which can launch convection. Uh, I'm just showing you one example. Okay, so, and this is, this is, again, as I said, it's about the scale of a GCM grid cell, so if you're trying to represent this process in a model, you somehow have to have a theory for all of that uh, in each grid cell. So it's not an easy problem. Okay, so, um, so, that ex so that's one way of getting over this potential barrier here. So um, what, we've, what we've thought about so far is all one-dimensional. Okay, I've, I've said we have a parcel of air and it, and it rises up and is it buoyant or not? But what happens is once it rises up, it can condense water. And um, in spite of what I was saying about those downdrafts, most of the condensed water falls out. It has this annoying habit of falling out of the atmosphere because it's heavy and, and leaving spots on our windscreens of our cars and, and uh, all sorts of other things that it does to us. It makes our plants grow. I guess it's not such a bad thing. But uh, it's bad for the meteorologist because it's really the fact that the water falls out that creates all of our problems because it means that when the air comes down again, it doesn't, the, the reverse of what happened on its way up doesn't happen because the water isn't there to re-evaporate into the air again. So it follows a different uh, thermodynamic trajectory when it comes down. And this asymmetry uh, creates all of our problems, really. Um, and uh, what you see here is that any time you have this small scale overturning that we diagnosed by looking at, at CAPE, um, it, it ends up, once, once it starts generating rain, and uh, every, uh, every liter of rain that falls out leaves behind two and a half megajoules of, of energy in the air. That energy heats the air up, and it makes the circulation want to do something like that. Okay, so it, it automatically creates larger scale circulations than the ones that initially caused rain to happen. And likewise, if anything else causes a circulation like this to occur, the, um, the lifting of this air and the import, import of water vapor into that region will almost invariably lead to the smaller scale processes. So they're intimately coupled in both directions. And in fact, um, because they're so tightly coupled, there's, there's a confusion when people say moist convection, what they really mean. Because sometimes they just mean the clouds, uh, whereas um, technically, uh, as, since this circulation here is transporting buoyancy and temperature upward, it's part of the convection too. But people often don't think about it, and they only think about this. And this can lead to arguments over whether convection is doing this or that. Sometimes the whole argument is because one person is thinking of convection as this and the other person is thinking of it as that. So this is something to be careful of when you're, when you're studying the literature. So we have this situation. We can't just think of it uh, locally in a column. We can. Uh, there is an instability uh, which you can release simply by rearranging parcels of air in a column. But once you do that, a larger scale thing is going to happen. And this was recognized um, in the 50s, maybe before. Uh, uh, and how to cope with it was the question. Whoops, what happened? Why is it switching? OK, that's the slide I want. Um, how to cope with it was the question. Well, um, Charney and Eliasson, you probably know these names by now. Uh, they're, they're, they're heady with success at their quasi geostrophic theory. This is about the time when um, that theory was being used operationally to start to generate weather forecasts. They had computers. Magrinsky was going at GFDL, and they were doing it in Sweden. Rossby was doing it. Um, so everything was great. But the problem is, uh, we have this nice theory for mid-latitude. They didn't have one for the tropics. We have hurricanes. Nobody knew why we have hurricanes. Why are they the size they are? Uh, why does the Hadley cell have the size it has, and so on. There's a lot of things happening in the tropics that people couldn't explain with nice, they didn't have a, the equivalent of a Rossby radius, doesn't work. So um, these guys came forth uh, with a very influential paper in 1964 proposing a linear theory that would explain the scale of a hurricane. And it came to be known as CISC, convective instability of the second kind, this, uh, this mechanism that they put together. In this particular paper, they started by doing what I just said you can't do. They linearize the equations of motion, uh, which is fine. But then they find that they need an equation for the heating rate from convection, from condensation. And they assumed that 
it would just be, they, they took it to be the upward velocity times the slope of this curve here, if it were a saturation curve. Done. Okay, so that was their parameterization, if you will, of rainfall. And they solved the equations. Uh, they solved it with rotation. And they found that um, once you start a, uh, a circulation going with a heat source, it amplifies. And it amplifies out to scales like the scale of a tropical cyclone. And a, a large part of the amplification, amplification came about uh, because of um, vortex extraction in the lower troposphere, which drove an Ekman layer, Ekman transport, into the, into the storm. So this was great. And uh, it um, generated a lot of interest. So over the next 20 years, this really became a kind of a focal point for, um, for research on tropical meteorology and convection. Um, unfortunately, it didn't really work out. So um, other calculations showed that uh, this instability really was greatest at the very smallest scale, and it really only explained an individual cumulus cloud. Um, one of the things that was criticized a lot about this was the closure that they used where you take the slope of this and multiply it by W, which some people started calling a cis closure. Some people liked it, some didn't like it. But it actually turns out that the linearization they did is probably the, the biggest problem. Because when you linearize equations of motion, you get rid of, you, don't, you no longer can advect the anomalies that you have, okay? And it turns out that the upward advection of the warming anomaly in the storm is crucial because it helps stabilize and, and uh, stabilize the system. And without that, you get too much instability. And there were some other, there were some other problems too um, with this. And lots of people criticized it, some people defended it. But I think, and then Lindzen came along, you may have heard of him, uh, and proposed something called WaveSysk, which I haven't really looked into very carefully. I don't think it, it, it's also been criticized. Kind of when the dust settles, what we decide is that qualitatively, there's no question that there is a positive feedback here, and it's important. It's important in allowing clouds to live much longer than they would and to encourage them to organize. But quantitatively, the theory, theories like that don't seem to work because the problem is just too nonlinear. Okay, the, the, uh, the processes that control the scale of a hurricane are nonlinear, and um, nonlinear effects that are neglected in a linearized calculation are important. So, and there's a very nice uh, uh, summary of this which I read uh, to remind myself of all this by uh, Roger Smith, which I can uh, recommend if you want to know more about this. Okay, so one of the elements that is missing from Charney Eliasson's model is they didn't, they assume that the only way a storm gets moisture is from bar stealing it from other places in the atmosphere, bringing it in. However, as recognized by Uyama, who was also thinking along similar lines at a similar time, uh, he did some somewhat more nuanced modeling of this, which didn't get quite as, but also got a lot of attention. And he pointed out that the, um, the strong winds that, that you find down here evaporate a lot of, uh, of, of water and energy off of the ocean, and that this might be, and he found that this was important. He found that he could get intensification of hurricanes with that effect, but not without it. And that idea was picked up by Kerry Emanuel, who uh, was quite successful, I think, in, in I don't know if I want to say marketing it. That's, that's maybe a bit mean. He gave it a name, Wishy. One of the lessons from my talk, give something a name and you'll, and you'll, and you'll, and it'll run far, you'll run farther with it if you don't. Um, and he came up with a really clever uh, model, conceptual model of a hurricane based on a Carnot cycle, which I'm not going to go through. Uh, but um, the wind-induced heat exchange was an important part of that model. And um, this idea has been taken up more broadly uh, Kerry was pushing it as an explanation for the, mat, for the eastward propagation of the Madden-Julian oscillation. I think most studies are showing that that's probably a secondary effect. But nonetheless, um, we do know that uh, wind speed changes on the surface of the ocean are quite important in helping to take energy out of the ocean, put it into the atmosphere where it can help drive storms. All right, so basically this is, this is pretty depressing so far. We can't use linear theories, Charney and Eliasson's thing didn't work. Uh, it's all hard, we don't have a strict instability criterion, we don't know how to explain the size of the storm. So let's go to something easy. Let's look at radiative convective equilibrium. We think we understand that, right? So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. 
When does my talk end? Is it um, 1230 or um, 12? Probably before then. Before then. OK, Technically good. 12, I think that's perfect. OK, I'll probably be finished with it before 1215. So um, we take this uh, theoretical adiabatic curve. This is in the tropics, where, which is really dominated by upright convection. And you get this blue line here. If instead, so that's, that's what you would expect if you have very rigorous mixing of the atmosphere. Uh, and if that were the only process, you would expect the temperature profile to come on top of the blue line. The red line is what you would expect the temperature profile to do if you only had radiation moving heat around and no mixing. So this is a radiative equilibrium profile, extremely warm at the surface, very cold up here. If you look at the observations, they're comfortingly very close to this blue line. So that's telling you that uh, moist adiabatic theory is, is a pretty good theory for the temperature structure of the atmosphere. <coughs> that's good. So finally, we can do something. OK, this doesn't tell us relative humidity. It uh, doesn't tell us anything about the circulation. But at least it tells us how the temperature should decrease with height. So that's good. Um, I'm going to switch gears slightly and say, what do we know about uh, in the absence of, of water vapor about convection. We already had a lecture about this. Um, but I'm going to specifically consider the case where we have a heat source at the bottom and distributed cooling all through the atmosphere. Because it turns out that if you take the observed humidity distribution in the atmosphere today and you work out the net radiative cooling, which is kind of arising because of the difference between this curve and this curve, it's pretty constant through the troposphere. It's about uh, a degree and a half or two degrees Kelvin per day worth of cooling. So to a reasonable approximation, it's a lot like this lava lamp. The sun is heating the surface. And uh, this is driving convection. And then all through the interior, the fluid is cooling again. So what do we expect to happen in this situation? Um, it's called the Prandtl problem. and uh, you, you can imagine that you can work through a sort of scaling analysis, OK? We're going to have some sort of turnover time. We're interested in what that is. And um, in, we know that, OK, the W and the C there are showing where the fluid is warmest and where it's coldest. As long as it hangs around at the bottom, it's going to get heated. And then as soon as it leaves and starts going up, that's where it's got the highest temperature it's going to have. And by the way, when I say temperature, I mean in the atmosphere of potential. Actually, I mean virtual potential temperature. OK, let me take a sidestep here. Water vapor only has a molecular weight of 16. And the rest of the gases average out to 29. So we have to make a correction for changes in the composition. It's a bit like salinity in the ocean. And there are actually situations in the boundary layer where uh, the rising air is slightly um, uh, cooler than the sinking air. And all the convection is being driven by the fact that the rising air has more water vapor and it's got a lower molecular weight. So it is something that you have to worry about. And uh, what we do is we define something we call the virtual temperature, which is the temperature that dry air would have to have to have the same buoyancy as the air actually has with its water vapor. So that's the temperature I mean when I say temperature. I'm not going to say virtual potential temperature all the time. We have to worry about that. OK, back to this. So it's going to have the highest value of that when it leaves the surface. Then it's going to float up here, hang around, sit down. All this time, it's steadily losing enthalpy. So when it finally arrives at the bottom, that's when it's going to have the lowest enthalpy. Right? So we're going to have a temperature contrast here, which I'm calling delta T. And if we know the heating rate Q, uh, and we multiply that by the turnover time divided by the specific heat, that gives us delta T. It's just the delta T that arises during that, during that trip that it takes. This is just a scaling relationship here. And um, this is basically a, a dynamical relationship, uh, which you get by saying that velocity equals acceleration times time, position equals velocity times time, uh, and work that out and know that the acceleration is proportional to the buoyancy, which is given here, delta t on t 
times g, that's the buoyancy. Therefore, the acceleration, the velocity is equal to the square root of the acceleration times the distance. So there's another scaling relationship. If we put all that together, we get the Prandtl scaling, which is here. I told you I wouldn't show you any equations, which is true, because I didn't put any equal signs here. But um, <laughs> some math, there are some exponents. I didn't promise there wouldn't be any exponents. Okay, you don't need to remember all this. The, the point here is that you can get a relationship for tau. Uh, it depends surprisingly weakly on the heating rate and other things. Up here? Oh, right. Uh, it takes time tau for the air to go boop, boop, boop. The heating rate is Q. Multiply that by tau, and you get a delta T. Sorry, the cooling rate, yes. The cooling rate, that's right. And you assume it's uh, the, uh, the atmosphere is transparent for the whole thing? We're assuming that in this fluid system, there's cooling everywhere except where there's, he there's heating at the surface and cooling everywhere else, because that's a reasonable approximation for the troposphere in practice. Okay, this tells you an overturning time, so that's good. Uh, but it doesn't tell us the velocities, it doesn't tell us how narrow or how broad the upward motion is going to be. I'm going to assert that the updrafts will narrow until the, they are narrow enough to dissipate the turbulent kinetic energy that is produced in this cycle. All right. Um, but uh, this theory doesn't give you that. Okay, so here is a numerical simulation from Perotti et al. for dry convection. In this case, heating at the surface, cooling throughout above that. And I've compared it with a photo from the space shuttle. And it looks a lot like, it looks a little like kind of messed up rayleigh Baynard convection. Um, you've got these narrow, relatively narrow bounds of upward motion and these broader regions of sinking. Okay, and you've got the same thing here. In fact, they look very similar. This is, that was at the surface. This is the velocities in the middle of the layer. Same story. Um, and so just the fact that you're heating the, heating the thing at the, at the bottom and cooling, and the cooling is distributed through is enough to break the symmetry and give you these narrow upward motions and the broad sinking motions. Okay, we haven't put any water vapor in yet. We've already got that. Um, and I can tell you that you can get this, but you can also get this upside down in the atmosphere if you have a, uh, an overcast layer with long wave cooling, strong long wave cooling from the overcast layer, then you find the air drops in narrow, narrow blobs and it rises slowly. So there's nothing special about up or down. What matters is the asymmetry in the way the system is heated and cooled. Okay. Um, and I'm also going to assert that, uh, that the narrowness of these is, is, is assuming a value necessary to dissipate the kinetic energy. So you've, you've heard now that we are developing, we're generating available potential energy by heating the bottom and cooling the top, and somehow that's converting into kinetic energy and then that's being dissipated. And the dissipation rate, I think Todd showed this, scales as the square of the gradients of velocity. So. If I know what my overturning time is, I know how much mass goes up and down every hour or whatever. Um, if I squeeze it into a narrower range by a factor of two, this goes up by a factor of 16. Because I've taken, it's gotta go twice as fast. It's half as wide, so that's four times the derivative, and then we square it. So this thing is extremely sensitive to small changes in the, uh, in the thickness. And I think that's, and I think it's just getting thin enough so that it, uh, it will um, dissipate as needed. So if we change the viscosity a lot, we might, if we lower the viscosity a lot, we'll make them thinner. Increase the viscosity, we'll make them fatter. And I think that's what will be observed in a simulation, right, Todd? I think it's leaping in the right direction. Good. Okay. So that's dry. We kind of know what's going on with dry convection. Now what happens when we put water vapor in? Here's a paper by um, Paul Louis and Held. 2002, where they uh, did this. They compared um, what I just showed you before, dry convection and moist. And look at the difference. Can anyone tell me why we went from having all that activity in the dry case to so little activity in the moist case? Ignore the bottom panel. That's just the water concentration in the moist case. These updraft speeds are about the same as these. It's just that they are only occupying 
about 5% or 10% as much of the domain as they were. Why is that? Okay, maybe nobody knows. All right, here's the answer. Uh, the reason is that that primal scaling that I just showed you is now out the window because when the air moves up, all this latent heat is released and converted into sensible heat, and the potential temperature changes from 300 to 360, roughly. And then it takes, uh, in the atmosphere, it takes about 10 days for radiation to reduce that 360 back to 300 again. So we have two totally different temperature scales in the problem now. We have a horizontal temperature difference, which is tiny, like one degree, and we have a temperature difference here, which is huge. And the tiny one is the one that's driving the flow, and the huge one is the one that's controlling the time scale. So the overturning is very slow compared to what it would have been without that latent heat release. But the upward transport of energy is just as much as with this super fast dry convection because there's so much latent heat in here. And 95% of the upward transport of energy is in latent form. So basically, the, a given overturning becomes 10 or 20 times more effective at transporting heat when you've got water vapor in the system. Okay, this was already known. This was not a new result of Olivier and, and Isaac. Uh, we already knew that, that most of the upward transport of heat is in vapor form over the oceans. But they looked not only at the heat budget, but at two other uh, less looked at budgets. One is the, um, as I mentioned, the turbulent kinetic energy budget. You're generating and destroying turbulent kinetic energy. Uh, how are you destroying it? And they looked at the entropy budget. Because we're heating the system where it's warm and cooling it where it's cold, we're, um, the system is exporting entropy to space. Okay, the, the, the radiation leaving the planet has more entropy than the radiation coming in. The system is losing entropy. But then, by all the random irreversible stuff that it does, it generates the entropy again. So uh, they also looked at how it's generating the entropy. So they looked at that. How is it getting rid of the turbine kinetic energy, and how is it transporting the heat? This is the heat conclusion. We knew that already. The turbulent kinetic energy, this was really interesting. Most of the dissipation is by drag of air as it goes around falling raindrops. Okay, it's not the shear at the surface. It's not the turbulent dissipation in the turbulent cascade of motions on the way up. It's air flowing around the raindrops. Sorry, flowing this way. The raindrop is falling. The air flows around it. Dissipation right there. Okay, not all of it, but over half was from that. Pretty, uh, pretty surprising. Nobody's really thinking about that. And the entropy budget, um, they found the main uh, way that the system produces entropy is by mixing uh, very dry and very humid air. That makes entropy. Okay, so important processes that we need to be thinking about. Now you might think, well, okay, this is uh, that's interesting, but you know, it's kind of an academic detail. All right, this is, uh, this is Marat's simulation. Again, uh, he called it Giga LES. You've already seen it, so I'm gonna skip it. Uh, but I showed it to remind you, here are some simulations that are of the same size box, but at a much coarser resolution, but they did lots of them, uh, and slightly earlier, by uh, Perotti and Emmanuel. And they looked at what happens in a, mo a simple model. They didn't have ice processes, but they did have rain. But they um, stipulated in the model what the raindrop size would be. So. Um, you can say all my raindrops are that big or all my raindrops are that big, and they just said that. And here's what they get with, with tiny raindrops that fall very slowly. Here's what they get with big raindrops that fall fast. This is vertical velocity looking down. Okay, you can see that there's much more intense, narrower updrafts in this case than there are in that case. Strange, they didn't change the forcing of the system, the heating's the same, everything, all the dynamics of viscosity, everything's the same. All they did was change the size of the raindrops, and that happened. Okay, and here's a graph of all their experiments. The assumed terminal velocity of raindrops on that axis, and the peak rain rate here, which is related to the peak vertical velocity. And up until a terminal velocity of about 20 meters per second, it's almost linear. The faster the rain's falling, the, the stronger the updrafts get and the higher the rain rate, okay? And this isn't because, uh, oh, if the rain, rate, rain drops faster, of course it'll just rain more. The only way to sustain these higher rain rates is to, is to have a bigger vertical velocity and import more water, process more water through the system. The residence time in, in the state of, in, in the rain itself is too short for, for just 
for, for changing the rate of that by itself to be doing it. it has to, it's changing the dynamics, and we can see that here because this is vertical velocity. So um, this, I think this seemed really crazy to people at the time they published this. But it actually makes sense if you think about Olivier and Isaac's results. Because, um, and if you think about my assertion from before. Because uh, what Olivier showed is that most of the dissipation is in the flow around the raindrops. And uh, by the way, a realistic um, raindrop terminal velocity is somewhere in here. So the real world is, down, is not up here where it saturates, but down here where it's still quite sensitive to the raindrop fall rate. And um, if you consider that the turbulent dissipation, that the dissipation of energy comes partly from working against the weight of the rain and partly from shear, uh, on this part of the curve, I would assert this is dominant. And then when we make the rain fall out fast enough, it doesn't matter anymore, and this becomes dominant, and you stabilize out there. That would be my interpretation. They, they give a more or less equivalent, but they don't talk about turbulent dissipation, but they, they point out that the slower the raindrop terminal velocity, the more liquid water is going to accumulate and the, and the heavier it's going to be, and the more that's going to retard the, the updraft. Okay, so this is, this is telling us that radiated convective equilibrium is more complicated than we thought, because we didn't really think we had to worry about the sizes of raindrops. So it turns out we do. Okay, there's something else that we didn't expect that comes out of numerical simulations. And um, the, the results I'm going to show you now are from a paper by Brothers and all 2005. And they ran a model with a domain a bit larger than the ones I was showing before. Uh, kind of a coarse resolution again. And um, this is what they, their domain looked like after 10 days. This is the precipitation field. Kind of looks like you'd expect, you know, spotty sort of precipitation. Uh, this is the heat flux at the surface and the wind vector. This is the integrated water content through from the surface all the way up. Uh, so values around 40 uh, millimeters. And then this is the outgoing long wave radiation, so it's kind of telling you where the clouds are. And red is where you don't have clouds, and blue color is where you have clouds. Okay, that all looks fine. Here's what they look like after 20 days. You're starting to get a little bit of organization of the rain here, but otherwise uh, it looks kind of similar to before. This is what they get after 50 days in their simulation. All the rain has gone into a little blob, and it never changes after that. The blob seems to last forever, as long as they run the model. Okay, not good. Well, interesting. Um, good, I don't know. So um, the domain average rain rate is actually greater in this case because with all the rain squeezed into a small ball, uh, there's much more outgoing long wave radiation, less cloud cover, less water vapor, and uh, stronger surface fluxes to balance the greater loss of heat from the system. So the whole hydrologic cycle is going faster, um, but the convection and all the and the rain is raining harder, but it's all raining in one spot. Now, one really interesting thing about this is how does it come about? It doesn't come about because a bunch of storms all get together and decide to have a party and everybody else joins. It actually happens because um, it's more like the stinky person comes and everybody runs away. There's, there's a, a blob of dry air here. And the blob of dry air spreads and spreads until it finally occupies the whole domain except for this little stronghold where all the, where all the rain retreats into. Okay. And, and the reason this happens is it's a radiative dynamical instability. Once you start getting a patch of dry air, you start moving, your, your humidity profile starts moving toward that. And, the, and that means you have a bigger gradient of humidity from here to here. And that gradient of humidity is what controls the net cooling of the atmosphere. So it starts cooling more. But the more it cools, 